Welcome everyone to the Penn State College of Medicine Understanding Primary Immunodeficiency. It's a Project ECHO Clinician Education Series, and we're delighted to have you join us again today. My name is Jackie. I'm a member of the ECHO team. I'll start us off with some quick announcements and introductions. My colleague, Caitlin, is also online. So if you have any technical questions, feel free to reach out to either of us throughout the session. Um, if you are logged in with a name that we cannot identify, please put your name into the chat for our record keeping purposes. And if you have multiple people joining with you, please include all of their names in the chat as well. We ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking. Of course, you can uh, use your webcam, you can unmute, or you can use the chat at any time during the session with questions and answers. Please remember that when we're discussing cases that no personally identifiable information or PHI is allowed. We are recording these sessions for educational and quality improvement purposes, and we share all materials after the sessions. In the spirit of Project ECHO's All Teach, All Learn approach, we're always on a first name basis during our sessions, if you're comfortable with that. Um, today's session, we're going to have a, a brief talk on comorbidities and PI and a case discussion. Um, again, during the presentation in case, feel free to put your questions into the chat or to unmute. We have a team of specialists online. I'm gonna have them introduce themselves shortly. They'll help field questions, but remember that this is all teach, all learn, so everyone can ask questions and provide answers. So let me ask our hub team to introduce themselves, and I'll start with Colleen. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending upon where you're located. My name is Colleen Brock. I am a registered nurse and manager of medical programs at IDF. I am also a person with PI, and we have two young adult children with PI. Thank you. Paula. Hi, I'm Paula Now I'm a physician um, that takes care of patients um, with primary immunodeficiency. I work at Hershey Medical Center as an allergy immunologist. Thank you. Ken. Good morning from Texas. I'm a, my name is Ken Bass, and I'm a patient with primary immune deficiency. I also work with IDF as a support group leader for others who have PI here in Texas. Thanks, Ken and Diana. Good morning. My name is Diana, and I am the mother of a child with PI. Thanks. And Taha, if it's okay, I'm just going to turn things over to you. You can introduce yourself and start to walk us through our case and lecture. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, uh, my name is uh, uh, Taha. I'm a uh, staff allergist immunologist at Hershey Medical Center and an assistant professor of medicine at the Department of Medicine, uh, section of allergy asthma and immunology. And uh, first, I would like to thank Dr. Hanna for extending the invitation to speak uh, on this important educational activity um, and uh, share our experience about taking care of patients with the primary immunodeficiency. Um, let me just go ahead and share the slides. Now, please let me know if everybody is able to see the slides. They're good, thank you. Great, so, um, so if, uh, it's part of understanding primary immunodeficiency ECHO series for clinicians, and uh, uh, this is disclosures from the ECHO projects, and this is mine and among others disclosures. Uh, so we will talk about comorbidities and primary immunodeficiency, and uh, um, I, I know that the kind of the, uh, the in terms of organization of the uh, um, uh, the talk is reorganized to start with a flash talk, and then we can talk, discuss a case. Um, so um, the objectives of this talk, of this flash talk, I would say, is to recognize the different comorbidities associated with common variable immunodeficiency, and to recognize potential treatment strategies, um, or, um, or at least discuss some approach to these patients. So first, we're going to start that non-infectious complications uh, is really the other face of primary immunodeficiency disorders. So similar to recurrent infections that we start to recognize, autoimmune and non-infectious manifestations can really suffice a critical diagnostic criteria when, when we talk about patients with uh, uh, common variable immunodeficiency. So uh, all uh, diagnostic criteria, including the European Society of Immunodeficiency, include uh, autoimmunity as one of the key diagnostic criteria um, uh, for immunodeficiency disorders. And when we look into uh, CVID, really one third of those patients struggle from autoimmune and non-infectious manifestations. So out of uh, uh, three patients with CVID, we'll have one uh, who will have some sort of autoimmune or non-infectious manifestations. Uh, when it looks into 
the kind of the types of autoimmunity, the most common would be probably autoimmune cytopenia, but I also want you to recognize that lymphoproliferation is really as common as even even more common than autoimmune cytopenia. Um, now, autoimmune cytopenia in itself is not, is not only the most common autoimmune manifestation of CVID, but it's also associated with higher also having other non-infectious complications such as lung disease, GI disease, and liver involvement. So um, when we see autoimmune cytopenia, this just tells me that is there more to look for in these patients. Um, but I also want you to recognize that uh, there is uh, 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 other uh, common comorbidities, including lung disease, like interstitial lung disease, including granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease, um, as well as um, uh, enteropathies and inflammatory bowel disease being common comorbidities of patients with CBID. Um, Non-infectious complications are really more problematic because now when we have the advent of immunoglobulin replacement therapy, we'll be able to take care of the infection part of the, of the immunodeficiency, but we still struggle with the non-infectious complications. And in fact, mortality is much higher among patients with non-infectious complications. Um, and in fact, it's estimated to be 10 times higher than patients without non-infectious complication. And uh, based on analysis of the USID net registry, uh, we understand that it's the lung disease other than bronchiectasis, liver disease, GI disease, and lymphoma are the non-infectious complications that are correlate or that are associated with increased mortality. So I'll just kind of list some of these kind of non-infectious complications, uh, highlight some of their significance, uh, and then also some approach options. So we will start with the most common, which is autoimmune cytopenia, the most common being uh, uh, ITP. Um, again, this is the most common complications. They do carry significant morbidity to, to patients. Uh, so uh, most of the time we have to treat those patients with immunosuppression. They are already immunocompromised. Adding immunosuppression is certainly not helpful on these patients and can increase the risk of infections. Uh, and while per se, they are not associated with increased risk of mortality, as we saw from analysis of the USID net registry. However, they are linked with other complications and those other complications are associated with increased risk of mortality. So one thing we have to do for patients with CVID is we often like to monitor their CVC um, on a regular basis. So certainly at time of diagnosis and then on maybe annual basis, depending on the uh, degree of complications that you see in these patients. And when, if we identify them, uh, we have to treat them per hematology guidelines. So we have to treat them with systemic steroids, high dose IVIG, and even rituximab. And, and we know that patients with CVID, they tend to have dysfunctional B cells that can increase the risk of autoimmunity. So rituximab may offer an attractive choice. We, we like to keep, however, splenectomy to the last resort because we really don't want to add other uh, 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 persistent immunodeficiency to those patients by uh, giving the, by removing their spleen, and and, uh, um, um, uh, and 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 also interesting in those patients is that once we treat their ITP, for example, we like to keep their IgG level above seven hundred because uh, you know, studies have shown that if we try to keep their trough above seven hundred, we are let they they experience less recurrence of their autoimmune cytopenia. Um, so that's as far as uh, autoimmune cytopenia. Um, and when it comes to bronchiectasis, certainly this is a significant comorbidity morbidity in patients with CVID. However, they are per se not linked to uh, mortality. Uh, when we have bronchiectasis, we like to target a trough level more than 1,000. And um, the idea is that to, to reduce the risk of recurrent infection to the points that, and hope that we will reduce the progression of bronchiectasis. Uh, the other uh, uh, pulmonary complication of CVID is interstitial lung disease. And this kind of really takes a spectrum from just lymphocytic interstitial lung disease to all the way to granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease. This one not only carries significant morbidity, but also mortality in patients with CVID. So for those patients we like, uh, uh, and for that reason, uh, we really like to obtain CT scan for the chest for patients with CVID we really have multiple reasons to obtain CT scan for the chest with patient with CVID at time of diagnosis. Uh, for once, uh, maybe unrelated to comorbidities, but they may have thymoma as an explanation for their hypogam. 
Um, they can have bronchiectasis and that would need to be addressed and adjust our trough level, but they can also have interstitial lung disease. So there are really myriad reasons for us to obtain a CT scan at diagnosis. Uh, we also like to obtain full PFT, and I say full PFT, that would include diffusion capacity. Sometimes impaired diffusion capacity is really the earliest sign we can pick up as far as interstitial lung disease. Um, you know, and although we try to minimize kind of repeated exposure to radiations, we like to uh, at least follow those patients with uh, interval PFT every one or two years, depending on the uh, progressions of uh, lung disease, if any. If we identify interstitial lung disease, I have to say biopsy is critical to inform treatments because we really want to know what are we dealing with. Are there B cells for us to target? Um, because uh, uh, treatment options for those patients is again with immunosuppression and usually with rituximab alone. Some people um, uh, suggest that we can use just rituximab. Others, which is uh, and the most common treatment is rituximab plus an anti-metabolite like azathioprine and mycophenolate. Um, so again, we get the biopsy, we'll be able to tell if there are B cells and there are B cells, we can use rituximab. Um, and if there are no B cells, then probably using rituximab would not be um, useful. Um, the other common comorbidity is lymphoproliferations, and this can take multiple, many forms, including splenomegaly. And I think that probably um, is the most problematic in terms of causing significant morbidities, illicitiety and can confound autoimmune cytopenia, which we said is the most common because uh, many of these uh, um, uh, 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 cells uh, are sequestered in the spleen because of hypersplenism, and we can't really tell whether this is autoimmune or not. Um, nonetheless, we again try to really reserve splenectomy to the last resort uh, because of the, uh, 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 we don't wanna again add additional comorbidity to these patients. Um, liver disease is another organ that can be involved and um, is associated with significant morbidity and mortality as well, and can take many forms. Nodular lymphoid hyperplasia is probably one that is uh, characteristically associated with CVID, but then you can see you can get unspecified hepatitis, primary sclerosis and cholangitis. And again, if you have liver disease and liver dysfunction, we know that the liver is very important uh, immune organs. Um, it has the cuffer cells, so it's kind of one of the filter organs. We make complements in the liver, so it can increase the risk of infections. Um, and what we do for these patients, we really like to monitor liver functions uh, for patients with CVID on a regular basis. If we identify, um, we, we try to do a physical exam and ultrasound to look for hepatomegaly. And if we identify liver problem, it's probably uh, a prudent to involve a hepatologist to assist in the management of complications like complications from portal hypertensions. I mean, guidelines in terms of management of portal hypertensions evolves uh, very rapidly and having involved an expert in uh, treatments of portal hypertensions early on would be very beneficial for these patients. Um, another organ that can be involved is the GI, and this can take so really many forms. So uh, probably the most uh, difficult to treat form is the small bowel villus atrophy, celiac life, but it's not celiac. So, um, really a, a gluten-free diet would not be sufficient. And, but they can also get inflammatory bowel diseases, including the typical one, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, but they can also get microscopic colitis, especially lymphocytic uh, uh, microscopic colitis. And it does have a lot of significance. First, uh, it, it causes diarrhea, which can be very bothersome to patients. And in case of small villus atrophy, you can get a lot of nutritional deficiency, which can complicate the immunodeficiency um, and also can complicate IgG replacement therapy because of a protein losing enteropathy, uh, which can be very problematic because at this point, those patients who may also have lung disease and we're trying to target the trough above 1,000, we are even unable to get it to above 500 because we are losing the IgG uh, in their guts. And uh, certainly this is one of the, complication that is linked to increased mortality in patients with CVID. So I really like to ask my patients on every visit about diarrhea, chronic diarrhea it tends to be overlooked by patients. So we like to ask about them and uh, we check fecal caloprotectin. This is very sensitive to look for inflammations in the gut, alpha alpha one trypsin to look for uh, any evidence for protein loss in the gut, especially if the IgG is declining. Um, 
I like to rule out infection, even GRD. And they said, well, the patient does not have risk factor for GRD, but CVID is a risk factor. Um, and then uh, we like to work with an, a GI specialist who, who has interest in CVID, so they can may consider EGD and colonoscopy to screen for these diseases and, and, uh, and try to uh, start the management plan. We treat inflammatory bowel disease in similar fashions uh, as per GI guidelines. If you have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, but they can be resistant to uh, um, standard therapy um, and, um, and, there, and, and, and sometimes even uh, uh, cause more complication as we have more treatments option available. So for example, um, now we have the vedolizumab, which, is a, um, which can block lymphocyte um, and migrations to the gut and decrease the inflammation. Sounds like attractive choice for patients with typical ulcerative colitis or even Crohn's disease. However, uh, in this case, we are also blocking the, the, the migrations of regulatory T cells and can worsen their inflammation. So, um, however, we can see some cases that has been successfully treated with vedolizumab. So we, we still try to rely on um, guidelines established by our GI colleagues, but we caution them about these potential uh, complications from using uh, common treatments that, they're, uh, that, are, that are currently available. For small intestinal enteropathy, I I think nutritional support is important. Uh, and, and also considerations of mTOR inhibitors like uh, um, uh, serolimus, and this is kind of very attractive choice because you know serolimus tends to affect less the regulatory T cells, sparing the regulations, and hopefully this can control the inflammations. Uh, and finally, targeted therapies like uh, if we identify a genetic defect like CTLA4 haploinsufficiency, abatacepts can be very very useful um, in terms of controlling their gut inflammations and improving their um, um, uh, uh, gut inflammations and improving um, uh, uh, their overall nutritional status as well as um, decrease their protein losing enteropathy in case of small bowel enteropathy. The last comorbidity that I want to highlight is lymphoma. It's 8% uh, of CVID patients uh, has been, the, this is what we, I think uh, probably best to set the lifetime prevalence of lymphoma in patient with CVID is 8%, certainly uh, associated with increased mortality without a doubt. Uh, and again, this kind of calls for us to examine regional lymph nodes in patient with CVID. Uh, this includes the axillary lymph nodes, the uh, cervical axillary, as well as groin lymph nodes on, uh, on every annual physical. And we have low thresholds for lymph node biopsy, but it can get complicated because those patients will continue to have this lymphadenopathy uh, as part of lymphoproliferation non-malignant lymphoproliferation. So it would be difficult for us to decide when to do re-biopsy. I don't think there is any consensus on when we should biopsy those patients. But certainly a change in the lymph node or uh, size over time or change in uh, symptomatology can call for repeat biopsy. So uh, non-infectious complications is associated with higher chance that you're going to pick up a monogenic cause. And therefore, for all patients that I for all these comorbidities that we talked about, it's really reasonable to consider genetic testing. Um, and genetic testing uh, can offer both prognostic value um, as well as can identify targets for therapeutic intervention. So yeah, um, it's very useful, for example, if we know uh, based on what we know about, uh, if we identify CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency, for example, we can anticipate what will happen down the road, what complication those patients would have uh, what we watch for over the time. If we identified stat three gain of function, then we will be able to watch those patients for these complications more vigilantly. Um, so it does have prognostic value. It also have value in terms of family planning. Uh, and finally, I think uh, it's even more interesting in now is we identify targets for therapeutic interventions. I gave the example of Batocept, but our more example that I will discuss briefly in the coming slides. So consider genetic testing, especially in individuals with CBID and autoimmune complications. So uh, my current approach is I, I identify really features to suggest that this patient may have a genetic disease. If we start with a genetic panel and if we identify targets, we can target them. So we can use a battle support patient with CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency. Uh, we can use for patient with activated phospho, um, uh, uh, phospho inositol 3 kinase, Delta or PI3 kinase Delta syndrome, um, then those patients can benefit from uh, lineolisib, which is uh, currently FDA approved. And we can also use 
uh, tocilizumab, for example, for patients with stat three gain of functions or JAK inhibitors, although some debates about that for patients with stat one gain of functions. Uh, if we don't identify targets and we're trying to treat uh, uh, autoimmunity, we try to be empiric. Uh, we can use steroid, but I also want you to think about rituximab patients with uh, CVID because of their dysfunctional B cells that can maybe be responsible for uh, some of these, uh, even lymphoproliferations, as well as other autoimmune comorbidities. So, and again, why we said like genetics, because if you look into these genetic diseases that uh, offer targeted therapies, you can see the list of autoimmune complications um, embedded in their uh, clinical phenotypes. So if you uh, activate the PI3 kinase delta syndrome, you can see they can get uh, uh, autoimmune cytopenia, primary secretors and cholangitis, lymphoproliferations, and IBD, similar with the CTLI-4 haploinsufficiency and RBA, autoimmune cytopenia, early onset type 1 diabetes, sphenomegaline and IPD, and the same thing with the stat 3 gain of function. So you can see that these genetics, is really their phenotype is telling us if we have autoimmune complications, we have to consider genetic testing not only for prognostic value, but also for uh, identifying potential therapeutic targets that we can intervene. Um, so again, non-infectious complications are currently more challenging. And I have to say, every time I see patients with non-infectious complications, I know that we are going in the gray zone because there is no clear consensus on how to approach these patients as of now. Um, it does require multidisciplinary team. We really need to identify individuals within your health institutions or within your regional uh, uh, region who likes to take care of these patients, who is like to go and beyond the box uh, 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 and, and uh, look for uh, uh, how to approach these rare conditions in these patients in more creative way, I would say. Uh, these are some of the references. And uh, I think this is uh, as far as the brief talk and I'm happy to answer any qu questions from um, the audience. There is a question in the chat. I see here. Uh, that's excellent questions. I have to say, uh, so uh, serolimus, I think it's one of the treatment options that can be used in patients with uh, uh, with CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency. Um, I, ha I would, I, I, I think it it would be more reasonable to, to start using a baricep, but sometimes even the insurance does not allow us to use a baricep. I think this is one of the major barrier to using a baricep is that the insurance does not have, we are not having an, an indication for a baricep. Unfortunately, a baricep has been trialed, for example, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and have failed, and therefore it's no longer, and it's certainly the insurance say, well, it failed the clinical trials, so I'm not gonna allow you to use a baricep. Um, and, so it's sometimes difficult to convince the insurance and Cirolimus offers a very attractive choice. Again, Cirolimus can spare really the regulatory T cells and uh, by sparing the regulatory T cells, you may get the inflammation under control and sometimes even use as an adjunct therapy to a baricept when a baricept in itself is not enough. Uh, kidney complications. Um, um, interesting questions. I have to say, I mean, most of the time I see kidney complications as Maybe uh, to be to begin with, they start with chronic kidney disease. Um, not so familiar with autoimmune kidney manifestations, but I've seen sometimes granuloma affecting the kidneys, uh, and again, that would be responsive, for example, to uh, 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 rituximab plus minus anti-metabolites. I've seen only one patient with the granuloma affecting the kidneys, but certainly had granulomas elsewhere, um, which was probably the, the driver for using. Uh, the rituximab plus anti-metabolites. Um, uh, uh, but the kidney function remained stable in that patient, fortunately. Um, uh, we, we, we need to check the kidney functions because IVIGs, especially all their products, can influence kidney functions. So uh, we like to, to check that, but I think the newer agents are less likely to cause that. So um, that's as far as kidney complications. Does that answer your question? Yeah, we follow um, a creatinine level on our patients with CVID. Um, however, I I actually like Taha. I just don't tend to see new manifestations of, of renal failure. Um, most, I have a couple of patients that had 
either SLE or in one case, a STAT6 uh, mutation and was syndromic that had renal complications, but it doesn't seem like, I, I don't see it that often. Can you touch on what you mean by older product versus newer product? Yeah, so the, the I mean the uh, I mean kidney failure of the sick cross containing IBIG product was the uh, product that has been linked to kidney failure, and I think this problem I mean sick cross is a stabilizer that that, that was uh, being used for the IBIG product. I don't think anybody is probably now using sick cross containing IBIG product anymore to um, to raise this flag. I mean certainly the osmotic burden of IBIG can, in theory can cause kidney dysfunction. But I'm not seeing that anymore with the newer product of IBIG in general. So it was mostly linked to the sucrose containing IBIG. Do you know about when that changed? Um, it's probably a, a while ago because before even I start my training, uh, it was mostly historical, I would say. Yeah, most of the time when I, when I started my training, they, I was told that the sucrose containing IBIG would cause kidney failure and we have to check for uh, kidney function in patients with CBID because in theory, the osmotic burden of IBIG can um, cause kidney dysfunction. That's as far as I can tell. I'm just curious, my son's been on IBIG for 28 years and that's why I was asking how far back. Um, I mean, it was, uh, it was far back. I have to say like, you know, IBIG products have evolved over time. And mm -hmm. uh, I would say like, I have, I, I don't think anybody is using now Sucrose containing product uh, mm -hmm. um, anymore. So even if, it, if, if he was on Sucrose, probably he might have been changed to a newer product. Uh, um, yeah. Thank you. Certainly. Other questions? Yes, there's another one in the chat about authorizations. It was just a comment by Rita, just letting us know that um, uh, patients receiving um, IVIG, uh, their insurance are currently requiring a BUN and creatinine in addition to um, IgG levels just to, uh, to, to make sure that they get reauthorized or their first authorization. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something, uh, and I think that, I mean, you know, uh, it's always uh, a debate. For example, the patient says, is, uh, I mean, although we check the IgG on a regular basis, but if the patient is doing well, I mean, um, from an infection standpoint um, and his IgG remains stable for several years, we keep checking the IgG just to, for the insurance. I have no idea how much that would add, and also the P1 and creatinine is for theoretical reason that uh, the uh, theoretical reason that the osmotic great the osmotic load of IBIG can increase risk of kidney dysfunction. Great. Other um, other interesting questions. I think the discussion is really great. So. So if there are other questions, just put them into the chat and we'll try to address them later. Um, in the meantime, we'll go on to our case discussion. Yeah. So um, I have this uh, case, a 50-year-old woman, non-smoker with past medical history of ulcerative colitis and remission, was referred to our clinic for evaluation of worse in cough. Uh, the cough is dry and associated with dyspnea and exertion. Uh, she reports history of two pneumonias in the year prior to her presentation, the most recent of which was complicated by neutropenia. She had one more biopsy during the most recent pneumonia, which was told to be non-revealing for cancer to explain her neutropenia. Um, her workup for cough included multiple CT scans of her chest. The most recent revealed diffuse patchy nodularities and ground glass features, uh, non-specific mediastinal lipidopathy and bronchiectasis. Her PFT showed no evidence of airway obstruction or restriction, but moderately reduced diffusion capacity. Her family history is not revealing for any family members with recurrent infections or early death from infection. Um, and her physical exam um, and, um, is, is really not revealing except um, 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 uh, even saturating at 99% in room air. And um, 
So any thoughts, any um, uh, kind of open to the audience for any thoughts and uh, you may also think about any uh, kind of red flags for primary immunodeficiency. And I'm sure there is a lot in these patients that uh, uh, for primary immunodeficiency in these patients. The red flag that jumps out at me is the two pneumonias in one year prior to the presentation in your office. Yeah, certainly. So other red flags. Bronchiectasis. Absolutely. Um, so the lymphadenopathy. Dr. Gonzalez saying neutropenia as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely neutropenia. So, um, so I think you know, I think probably we touched on the main of them, the majority of them. Uh, so, um, I kind of let's see if I if I captured also the same thing. So, uh, and I think one of them is probably. Uh, should also raise flags is the ulcerative colitis, although it's reported to be in remission. Um, and I think that's something that probably um, is more even red flag when it's in remission, which means like the ulcerative colitis is probably not following the typical course. Usually ulcerative colitis is, is not, uh, uh, and cannot be in remission without some sort of a treatment and majority of patients. So uh, the other things is probably again, the two pneumonias and I have to say, um, usually pneumonia and uh, is, is uh, two pneumonias in a decade or even more than one pneumonia a decade is probably a red flag. Um, healthy people should not get pneumonia unless they have an underlying lung disease. Um, and certainly neutropenia, I mean, neutropenia can have in this, in this particular situation um, can be a red flag for two things. For once, it could be autoimmune as part of autoimmune neutropenia, which we can see in patients with CVID. Uh, but it can also be in, in the setting of XLA uh, or autoimmune, let's say, agamaglobulinemia, I would say, uh, can be XLA with this patient being woman. Uh, but we see like neutropenia as response to uh, acute illness, just like in this case. Um, um, and then bronchiectasis is certainly one of the red flags for primary immunodeficiency and the mediastinal lymphadenopathy. But also the diffuse patchy nodularities and ground glass features can also suggest some sort of interstitial lung disease. And you, and you can also notice that her PFT, while it didn't reveal any restrictions, it did show some impaired diffusion capacity, which can be early signs of interstitial lung disease. Um, so uh, let's kind of go into some of the uh, immunological evaluations. And I'd like to start with the CBC. Any thoughts about the CBC from the audience? Yes, I mean, uh, thanks for sharing. I think the, you know, since these settled findings, for example, the platelet count, it's uh, it's been low. And in fact, if you follow the platelet count on this patient, you can see that her platelet count was um, 180 and started to kind of dwindle over time. So um, indicating that there may be some sort of uh, autoimmune thrombocytopenia, which again, uh, a common feature in patient with a, a CBID. Um, I also look into the kind of the distributions of the white cell counts, and I think they are appropriate for these patients. Um, um, and so look further into details and uh, look into her immunological evaluation. I like to break it down by the B cell, T cell compartment. So start with the uh, B cell compartment. Um, you can see, um, I think the B cell percentage numbers uh, were appropriate. Uh, but interestingly, look at the distribution of immunoglobulin levels. I, I think it, uh, uh, you would wonder if there is uh, agamoglobinemia, but I'm wondering uh, what's the thoughts from the audience about the distributions of immunoglobin levels in these patients.
feel free to unmute yourself. We would love to hear anybody. Um, we, we want this to be as engaging as possible. Obviously, you've got a low A, and the M's not real great. Yeah. So, I think I'd... And the vaccine responses are non-existent, so that's not good. Yeah, I think overall, like the the the, the picture is very suggestive of significant uh, B cell dysfunction. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to say, like when we look into um, these subtle uh, variations in immunoglobulin levels, now we start to understand. I think the, uh, the USID net registry was a great project because it really informed us about the significance of these subtle findings. So, so for example, now we start to appreciate is that if we have a higher IgA level, it's tend to be protective against non-infectious complication, which is the topic of this talk, right? Um, um, and this patient has undetectable IgA. On the other hand, an IgM level that is more than 13 is actually associated with higher likelihood of progressive interstitial lung disease. And also interestingly, like if we, um, um, from analysis of the USID net registry, we, we, um, uh, we saw that a rise in IgM level can also correlate with ILD progression. So it's really now adding more um, into the uh, usefulness of looking into these isotypes, not only at the start of at the time of the diagnosis, where we are just taking a snapshot about the immunoglobulin to assist in the diagnosis, will also give us some indications about um, uh, the uh, 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 what to expect from these patients down the road, and can also be useful in, to be monitored on a regular basis. And with the photo process, is that these abnormal B cells that can hide in the lung, for example, they start to make IgM, and this IgM the more of these B cells in the line, the more IgM you would be able to detect in the, in the peripheral blood. Uh, we also did B cell subset analysis, and I have to say that it was not complete. I think the lab didn't process it as we requested it, but it did show decreased class switch memory B cells. Um, any thoughts about the significance of this uh, memory B cells? You can share your thoughts in the chats or um, um, um well one question that came up uh taha um is how often do you repeat um, IgM levels if someone has confirmed uh, um, interstitial lung disease? Yeah, absolutely questions. I think uh, more recently, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to follow this more carefully, especially in patients with interstitial lung disease. So when, when we have interstitial lung disease, we have to start a treatment plan. So for example, um, if we start rituximab or rituximab plus as a thioprint, then we would expect the IG, um, we would monitor those IgM level on a regular basis every time we see them, um, because you know a, a rise means that the interstitial lung disease is worsening. If they got if they go into remissions from their lung disease, then technically we have to watch them every six or twelve months, depending on the uh, follow up interval that you choose, depending on the kind of the uh, things that you're following up. And I I do I'm, I start to monitor the IgM because. Based on this new analysis, a rise in IgM can indicate that their lung disease would recur or would it progress. Uh, so it gives give us an idea whether they may benefit from additional treatment. And um, to answer your question about uh, the B cell uh, subset analysis, Dr. Gon uh, I'm sorry, Gonzalo um, mentioned that this is revealing of low levels of switched memory. Yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, I, I think, think it's Dosen um, is that the, um, it said, uh, mentioned um, there's a deregulation. Um, IgM uh, is normal in function. I'm not sure exactly what that, yeah. what that means. So uh, uh, I'm, um, uh, so, there, so let me answer the, uh, uh, the IgM since we are the topic of the IgM and then I, I go to uh, uh, Gonzalo, uh, Gonzalo in terms of the low level of switch memory B cells. So first in terms of the, we really, uh, in terms of the IgM, um, it's probably 
they, we believe it's produced by the B cells within these interstitial lung disease. So we don't expect, for example, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, just like what we see in the, in the gut. But the, what we see in these granulomas or the lymphocytes in the lung is really nothing but uh, a mucosal associated lymphoid tissue that should not exist in the lungs. And these probably are responding to something in the, in the outside and they start to make IgM. So probably the IgM is normal, is not causing autoimmunity or along this line, but it's kind of a reflections that you have the B cells who are unable to switch to IgA or IgM and respond to some external antigens. And this IgM, because it's in the lung, we see that it tries as the lung disease is worse. Um, yeah, so I think hopefully that I was able to kind of um, answer the IgM normal and function. Uh, probably again, it's normal in function. I don't think there's a study to check the IgM, but in theory, I would say it's probably in response to some sort of external antigens. Um, now, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, B, B cell subset analysis, I think uh, the uh, decreased class switch memory B cells, well, I think we should always check for it because it not only will be able to uh, indicate that it's, uh, there is a B cell dysfunction, which is part of the diagnostic criteria within the European Society of Immunodeficiency Diagnostic Criteria for CVID, but it also signifies um, increased risk of autoimmunity in patients with lung disease. And this has been um, kind of um, uh, long reported in patients with CVID and, and, and um, analysis of the European registry tried to phenotype patients based on the, whether they have decreased class switch memory B cells and whether they have um, kind of normal class switch memory B cells. Um, also, although not checked here, we can do further phenotyping by looking into the expansion of another subset of B cell, the CD21 low energic B cells. And we know that and more than 10% is associated with the granuloma formation and splenomegaly. So, so what we are trying to do is like, we're trying to use the, uh, the things that we've done all the time, the immunoglobulin levels to kind of associate with auto, an infectious complication, give us an idea, give us a prognostic indications. And also looking into these uh, careful analysis of B cells uh, to allow us to see uh, uh, whether those patients are at increased risk of autoimmunity and complications. So increased class switch memory B cells as well as expansions of the CD20 low energic B cells uh, can be associated with autoimmune manifestations. So they do have carry significance that extends beyond uh, confirming the diagnosis of CVID. Yes, I think uh, um, in terms of IgG subclasses, I have to say, um, 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 uh, we, 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 I stopped checking the IgG subclasses because if the IgG is low, I expect all the subclasses to be low. Um, um, and I think that's one of the reasons kind of fallen out of favor. It has now limited kind of utility. We check that most of the time patient with uh, selective IgA deficiency because there's kind of a phenotype when the IgG3 is also low and they can also get uh, specific antibody deficiency. But per se, it seems like IgG subclass deficiency, um, although it's still listed in, in, uh, as one of the primary immunodeficiency um, disorder um, is in, in itself, like the significance uh, is low. If you have a low IgG, we expect the IgG subclasses to be low and, and they varies depending on what, what type of infection you're dealing with. Certainly the absence of response to vaccine confirm B cell dysfunction um, um, and uh, it's required for diagnosis of CVID. Uh, so all patients with CVID should have poor response to vaccines. And I think uh, Dr. Arnau also mentioned that uh, uh, we stopped checking the IgG subclasses for that reasons. Yeah, so this is kind of the immunological evaluations. I kind of shift the gear a little bit to the T cell uh, compartments and you can see the T cell compartments uh, is largely within normal limits and as expected for patients with CVID, we expect the T cell compartment to be normal, but we look into the uh, T cell phenotyping. We saw like increased in effective memory T cells of the CD45 are all positive T cells. And again, um, although this is not all the time shown, but then we expect more effective T cell, more effective T cells in patients with autoimmune manifestation. It makes sense. Like the T cells are helping, uh, probably the B cells are 
uh, to generate these autoimmune manifestations. So they, we expect them to be more mature in that regard as, as we expect from any individuals with active inflammation. Uh, the lymphocyte response is, is, was reported as low normal TPH. I have to say um, 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 it's probably kind of, uh, I didn't put so much attention to that because we get a, maybe a, it was a, some sort of a lab um, error because the response to other uh, mitogens were normal. And we expect the PHA to be the strongest, so I didn't kind of pay attention. So the T cell compartments in these patients appears to be within uh, acceptable range, but uh, open to discussions from the group if any thoughts about the T cell evaluation of this patient. Okay, so, um, so we, we, we get a CT chest and you can look into um, that this patient has, does have um, um, bronchiectasis as, as well as some uh, testicial Lyme disease. I'm not good with reading CAT scans, but that's how it's reported. Um, uh, so you can see there's some evidence of bronchiectasis as well, uh, uh, as well as some interstitial Lyme disease. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, I think, uh, if you look back, we, I mean, the, the lab reported both the percentage as well as the absolute. And although the percentage of CD4 probably reported as low, the absolute numbers are within normal acceptable range, which kind of speaks to your thought that we should always um, uh, look into the absolute lymphocyte, uh, absolute numbers more than the percentage. Um, we did a BFT study and, and similar to what we expect is that we have um, normal, if you look into the FE1 and everything is probably within acceptable range for patients' age, sex, and uh, um, ethnicity. Uh, but you can see like the diffusion capacity was impaired. And again, this highlights that when we get the PFT in this patient, it's not enough to get uh, uh, um, an in-office spirometry to look for this unless they have a, an extensive disease. Uh, we expect that we need, need diffusion capacity assessment in these patients. Um, how do you approach this patient? Do we consider lung biopsy? Do we consider the genetic testing with other treatment options. Any thoughts about that? Uh, I think Patty mentioned genetic testing. Um, you know, I think in patients with this patient features recurrent infections, um, features multiple autoimmunity, including autoimmune cytopenia, um, interstitial lung disease, lymphocytic interstitial lung disease, and um, um, history of ulcerative colitis or probably another uncharacterized inflammatory bowel disease that we are unaware of. Um, and altogether, uh, genetic testing sounds like a reasonable thing to Maybe we can identify a monogenic cause that we can target with our therapy. Um, do we consider lung biopsy? Absolutely. I think bi lung biopsy would be very useful to see if this patient uh, does have B cells in the lungs that we can target or uh, or or is, is it only T cells in the lungs that we cannot target? Um, so absolutely. In terms of treatment, this would really depends on what we find, um, right? So, um, and, but it does probably involve some sort of immunosuppression. Um, uh, TB negative, yes. I mean, I think uh, we, we, this has been ruled out, but that's a good thought. I think we should probably check for TB in these patients, uh, especially with the granuloma. However, uh, I have to say the type of granuloma and distributions of granuloma tend to be different from TB, while TB prefers like the uh, organs that there are uh, kind of the epices of the lungs. Uh, this one tends to have more basal distribution. Um, but then again, it's a good thought. We have to probably check it, especially before embarking on immunosuppression. Mm. Other thoughts? Okay, so um, so we, we didn't get, unfortunately, lung biopsy. We, uh, the, uh, the pulmonologist felt like it has to be too invasive and bronchoscopy would not be sufficient to get the biopsy. So uh, we, we did genetic testing. Uh, we, it was non-revealing. It, it did show some heterozygous experience of indeterminate significant, undetermined significant, I would say. Um, and, um, um, and given the kind of the imaging findings, sir, um, uh, however, we kind of compiled her imaging findings, CVID diagnosis, and 
uh, we, we thought about trialing just rituximab monotherapy, which uh, did show clinical improvement in these patients. Um, um, and, and we thought about um, um, rituximab was also probably useful in treating the autoimmune thrombocytopenia. Um, so um, I, I got uh, a question, would you recommend a bronch to be done with biopsies on a patient with multiple cases of bronchitis, bronchitis every year? I mean, I think uh, uh, bronchitis in itself, is it because of an infection? Is the IVIG was, um, the trough level was adequate? I think that question would be, we have to figure out like why this patient is getting bronchitis and if it's infectious bronchitis, not uh, uh, um, not uh, other forms of bronchitis, but if it's infectious bronchitis in people, is, is patients getting recurrent infectious bronchitis, are we getting adequate IgG? Is the IgG trough level adequate? Um, and, uh, um, um, and then if the IgG, IgG level is adequate, we expect it to be adequate, the patient continue to get recurrent infections. Is there any unusual exposures, for example, at 23, whether she has kids around um, or has kids around that can bring kind of viral illnesses. Um, yeah, patient's occupation probably can increase the risk of exposure as well. However, I have to say with IVIG, we expect less of that because you get a, a, actually more um, uh, polyclonal IgG to protect you against many viral illnesses. Uh, and then if all of these turned out, I think the first thing we probably should get a CAT scan to see if there is any evidence uh, of any things that we can biopsy. And also uh, we may consider even uh, kind of a PFT with diffusion capacity before embarking on bronchoscopy because bronchoscopy, they have to go and find something. And if they can't see it on the CAT scan, they probably won't be able to biopsy anything on bronchoscopy as well. Um, yeah, so we, we perform a panel or, I mean, we did a panel through MBT, um, uh, certainly kind of, patients might benefit from holoxone sequencing to further uh, identify any potential culprits and uh, gene. Um, uh, usually uh, complete uh, holoxone sequencing probably would require um, kind of uh, insurance authorizations. It probably would not be uh, feasible for all patients. And uh, the thing is with, with the, at least with the target therapies, so with the things that we can target, they're all within the MVT panel. So uh, at least we didn't miss the CTLI-4, we didn't miss STAT, we didn't miss the um, uh, things that we expect with uh, what we can target. Some, all this other information probably would be useful in terms of knowledge of newer genetic disease that probably would cause similar manifestations as well as, um, 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 uh, as, well as by the... Um, uh, uh, as well as probably inform some prognostic fact progno prognosis. In terms of whether this is determined by algorithm, I, I, we kind of, I read the reports from the MVTA, which give you some information about the algorithm. We always kind of, I try to look into these genes and whether they may explain patients' clinical phenotypes. So we have to use our clinical judgments as well. So whether this gene, if it was heterozygous, uh, would this be probably deleterious to the point that caused a trouble so we look into that and, and, and I think based on our um, kind of uh, review of literature, based on what's available from the report, we can make an assumption whether this, could, if, it, uh, um, if it would be probably pathogenic or no. So it really requires uh, both. I mean, certainly um, in terms of functional assay, like we didn't use like any, um, we didn't kind of use these mutations in the mice and see if that would result in similar phenotype. I mean, so if, if you look into this one, for example, STAT2 is, is probably not involved in, 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 in B cell functions, um, where uh, BCL10 can be involved, but it's usually an autosomal recessive. Uh, this is complement factor H, which is less likely to be involved. Uh, now, this one can be involved, but usually it's autosomal recessive as well, and usually results in complete egg gamma, uh, in complete absence of B cells. So we, we still have the B cells here. Um, uh, so that's why probably it's difficult. And I think that's kind of the challenge when, when we order these testing, we tell the patients, I may or may not have a good explanation for some of your findings uh, because 
Uh, but if we like me to order it, I can proceed with ordering it with that, with the opportunities of identifying targets that we can treat with, um, or with the opportunities of identifying genes that may offer some prognostic indicator. But again, I caution them that there will be findings like this one that we may not be able to, to uh, determine the significance with certainty, uh, but we use our base, uh, best judgment. And I think this is something that uh, I, I think the patients with primary immunodeficiency appreciate the most is that we are with them on the same boat. We are learning about these genes together. We may not know them now, but in the future we may, and we share with them this fact. And I think they, they understand this. They understand that it's a rare thing and understand that, uh, that it's a work in progress. So uh, they may, um, we may have an answer now or to, to today or tomorrow. So they, I, I, I think once you work uh, with patients with CBID, they really start to appreciate this fact that they're sometimes going into uncharted territory. Um, again, we can, uh, fortunately, the taxima of this patient did improve. And although I'm not with CAT scans, but the, the radiologist read, uh, um, he kind of, uh, the radiologist read was significant and terrible improvements of the interstitial lung disease in this patient. How do you monitor these patients? Again, we like clinical parameters, so, um, infections, cough, dyspnea, and diarrhea, because this may signify um, 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 recurrence of these kind of interstitial lung disease or uh, recurrence of inflammatory bowel disease, yearly CBC with differential to low proto-immune cytopenia, yearly IgM and IgG, allopties, maybe abdominal ultrasound, and again, PFT with diffusion capacity. That would be our plan for follow-up on these patients. And I think with this, I concluded my presentation. So um, thanks everyone for listening and I'm open to any questions as well. Thank you so much, Taha. This was absolutely wonderful. Um, quick question with the last slide, the abdominal ultrasound. Um, what, what are you looking for typically with that? So I think uh, I have to say, I, I don't trust my physical examination of skulls that much, um, um, especially if I have like a patient who, who may be overweight in terms of identifying hepatomegaly or splenomegaly. Um, so um, um, I do physical exam if there is any suspicion. That's why I say I may consider ultrasound to look for this if they have kind of hepatomegaly or splenomegaly that I need to be aware of as well. And, and something that to watch for as well in subsequent visit. That's why I put kind of the question mark about ultrasound because technically if you trust your physical exam that you will identify any splenomegaly, but I have to say it's very difficult to identify splenomegaly, especially in obese individuals. Um, that's why I kind of put the ultrasound as an option. But there is no consistency in whether we should or not. Thank you. Paula, do you have a summary before we wrap up? Yeah, so uh, um, really quick. Um, so today, Taha did an amazing presentation on common variable immunodeficiency and um, its uh, complications that can be autoimmune in character with a wonderful case uh, showing the different pathology um, and um, different manifestations of a person with common variable immunodeficiency with autoimmunity, including um, interstitial lung disease, and how they can improve with directed therapy. Thank you. So just a quick reminder, um, there are a few questions in the chat. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, if, if we could answer those either yeah. in the chat, that would be wonderful. I, I see that. Thank you for your, uh, are, you, are there types of interstitial lung disease correlated with IgM? So, so the type of interstitial lung disease, it, again, it's like a spectrum. So we see like these lymphocytes aggregating and, and there's many theories. They think it's probably the B cells are dysfunctionals going into trying probably to fight an infection, uh, but then they are dysfunctional. So they stay there. The T cells come try to help them um, doing their job, but they are still dysfunctional. So they can't do that much they aggregate and they start to cause like uh, just busy airways and they can't, they kind of compare diffusion and cause this neon exertion and even cough. Um, and it seems like this is a spectrum. If you keep this, if this continue to happen, 
Now this will forms like a granuloma, which is just like a lymphoid follicle, we call it a granuloma. And so it's the same spectrum. And it seems like this one is, is the one that correlates with the IgM, excess IgM production and, and the rise in IgM. At least this is based on the analysis of patients who were, who were seen at Mount Sinai um, from the uh, Dr. Kennegan group um, uh, when they analyzed those individuals over time and they looked into their IgM, they found that they start with have higher IgM to begin with. And then when they follow this patient, they found that the rise in IgM actually correlates with um, uh, kind of the imaging findings of worsening interstitial lung disease and also worsening uh, lung function. So that's how they kind of uh, come up with this conclusion. I think this probably finding needs first to be uh, replicated in other cohorts. Um, uh, I would, um, I think I, we would like to wait to see from, for example, in European cohorts to kind of replicate these findings because it's really important to find and add more value to the IgM than what we thought about in the, to begin with. So uh, I look forward to more replicative studies um, to see like what are, what do we mean by this or is it really replicated, replicated in other cohorts as well. Um, um, Okay. Um, excellent. I think uh, the other things that I got uh, here, like having a, a, a child diagnosed with PI, um, having a child, uh, uncertainty of having a child diagnosed with PI is so important in the beginning stages. Um, 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 exactly. I think this is something that we always try to look for and we try to answer. Um, it's, and again, it's a learning process. And I think uh, um, I, I share your concerns, and I think as we learn more about these primary immune deficiencies, probably we'll have a better answer for parents when, in terms of when it comes to family planning and so forth. But I think at this point, sometimes we know when we know the gene and we know how it's transmitted, and we can tell with, with more confidence. At other times, uh, we may have more of a gray answer that we need probably will, will, will continue to be a concern for the parents. So um, hopefully as we learn, we can answer this question with more confidence over time. Diana, thank you for sharing that. Um, it is 102, so I just want to remind everyone to watch for your email with their evaluations. It needs to be completed for CME credits. But even if you don't want CME, we'd love your feedback. And a quick note, we are not back again until June 26th, so we have a, a three-week break instead of a two-week break before our next session. And that is all about um, teamwork. So we will see you again on June 26th. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely rest of your day.